If you have a Bible with you, please do turn with me now to uh, the book of 1 Kings. And we're going to read uh, chapter 1 and reading from verse 11. So 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 11. You may recall uh, the book of 1 Kings opens with uh, an elderly David who uh, seems to be lacking uh, in vitality and in energy. He's near the end of his days. Uh, and we have uh, his son, Absalom's brother, uh, following in Absalom's footsteps and seeking to take advantage of the situation and gain the throne uh, for himself. And that's where we uh, left 1 Kings 1 last time. So we're going to pick up our reading in verse 11. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? And David, our Lord, does not know it. Come, please, let me now give you advice, that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, Swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then is Adonai, sorry, why then has Adonijah become king? And while you are still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went into the chamber to the king. Now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was serving the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king. Then the king said, what is your wish? And she said to him, my lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, assuredly Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now look, Adonijah has become king. And now, my lord king, you do not know about it. He has sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the sons of the king Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army. But Solomon your servant he has not invited. And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will happen when my lord the king rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And just then, while she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. So they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today, and has sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance, and has invited the king's sons and the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest, and look, they are eating and drinking before him, and they say, Long live King Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your, me your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done by my lord the king, and you have not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? And David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. Well, we'll finish our, our reading there uh, as we uh, come to look into what God's word uh, has said. So then, Adonijah's coup is well underway. He's gathered his political allies. You can read of that in verse 7. And his coronation party at Enrogel uh, the spring just south of Jerusalem is now in full swing, uh, as we read in verse 9. This constitutional crisis in the nation of Israel is at a real tipping point. It looks like Adonijah, not Solomon, as God has chosen, is going to be king. And David isn't doing anything about it. In fact, he seems oblivious to it all. We touched on all of this last time, and we considered the reality of evil within 
God's people. That quite often the danger comes not from outside, not from uh, the world, but from inside the church. But the fact that the danger can often come from within, that there is often worldliness within the church, and that it is dangerous to us, doesn't mean that we have to just give in to it and let it gain dominance and let it win. No, actually what it means is that we must respond to it. And that's what we're going to think about now. And I've called uh, our study this evening, The Servants Who Love the Kingdom. The Servants Who Love the Kingdom. Because in Nathan and Bathsheba, that's what we have here. We have two servants, servants of King David, if you like, servants of God who love the kingdom. They are willing to stand up for the kingdom. They're willing to stand against Adonijah. They are willing to do what needs to be done to ensure God's purposes continue amongst his people. And just one thing that's important to know right at the beginning is that they are working together. There is two of them, not just one. Why is this so significant to see? Why is it so important that it is Nathan and Bathsheba together and not just Nathan or just Bathsheba? Well, it's because of a law which exists in the Old Testament, which I've actually referred to fairly recently when we were looking at the trials of Jesus. It's in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. The point is, if two people come to David with the same story, then David has to respond and David has to act. If just one person comes to him with the story, well, he could ignore it. But this is the law of God. Two witnesses have brought the same story to him. He has to act. So David must act because he's heard from these uh, two witnesses, Nathan and Bathsheba, as they work together. Okay, so we're looking at servants who love the kingdom. We're looking at Nathan and we're looking at Bathsheba as they work together. And we see, don't we, uh, at the start of our passage, that it's Nathan who is taking the lead. Look, read with me from verse 11. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? Come, please, let me now give you advice, that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go immediately to King David, and say to him. So, Nathan, first of all. Nathan loves the kingdom. We know Nathan. He's a prophet. He's a prophet of God. He's the one who told David that he would not build God's uh, temple. He's also the one who told David that the Messiah would come from David's line. And he is the one who confronted David over his sin with Bathsheba. He's a good and true friend of King David. He's ready to do what needs to be done uh, for the sake of the kingdom and to help his friend David, even when it isn't comfortable or it isn't easy. He is God's faithful servant. I can't imagine he'd ever experienced anything quite so hard in his life when he had to go to David over David's sin with Bathsheba and declare to him, you are the man. That must have been a terribly hard thing for him to do. But He's a faithful and a true friend. He loves God. He loves God's kingdom. And here he, he takes the lead, as we've just read. He knows that Solomon should be the next king. Uh, we don't read, though, here in 1 Kings that he receives any special uh, word from God that he must act here. He knows what needs to be done, and he steps up to do it. 
There is no need for him to have some special guidance or some special word from God here before he acts. It's clear what needs to be done and that he is in a position to do something. So he steps up and he does it. He knows what needs to be done. He gets on with what needs to be done. There is an important uh, principle here for us to, to consider. When we have a way forward, when it's obvious where we should be going and what we should be doing, then we have to get on with it. And that's what Nathan does. He gets on with it, but he knows he needs help. He knows he can't do it on his own. He knows he needs this second witness, and he wants somebody who is not only personally affected by what is happening, but somebody who also, like him, has the king's ear. He needs Bathsheba. She is in real danger in this situation, and she has the king's ear. So he goes to her, he warns her of what's happening, and he recruits her to help him. Make no mistake about this. Everything here rests on Nathan and his actions. Just like it did when David sinned with Bathsheba, everything rests on Nathan. Yet, in our estimation of, of Bible characters, if we were to kind of put a list together of significant Bible characters, I wonder, would we put Nathan on that list? Would we talk of Nathan in the same breath that we talk of uh, Abraham or Joseph or Moses or Joshua or even David or Daniel? Do we think of him at that sort of uh, I don't know, level of importance or significance in God's plan. I'm not so sure we do. But here we have a man who loves God's kingdom. Here we have a man who is prepared to serve in God's kingdom. Here we have a man who is prepared to, to do what needs to be done for the sake of the kingdom. And at least twice in the reign of David, he is used greatly by God secure David's reign and David's line. And therefore, he is a significant person in ensuring the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Our service, as we serve God, it, it might seem so minor to us in so many ways. We might think of ourselves as just little players in God's grand scheme. But the truth is, we don't know how crucial or how important even the tiniest little service that we can do for God may actually be. You know, I'm reminded of, of Mark 9 verse 41, where we're told that God even remembers every basic act of kindness that is done to his people. He sees all of our service. He sees every little thing we do for his kingdom. And we don't know in God's scheme, in God's plan, just how he is going to use even the smallest service that we do to his honor and to his glory. So Nathan takes the lead. But as we've seen, he doesn't work alone. He gets help. He seeks out Bathsheba who it would appear is as oblivious to what is going on as, as David seems to be. And he warns her of the danger she's in, in verse 12. He advises her about what to do about it, verse 13. Go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become the king? Then while you are talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. There's the reference to those two witnesses. He's going to come in and confirm her words. And he is true to his own word. He's true to his own word. Just jump down to verse 22. Uh, as Bathsheba is talking to King David, we read in verse 22, and just then, while she was still talking with the king, 
Nathan the prophet also came in. And then in verses 24 to 27, we have him backing up and supporting and confirming uh, Bathsheba's words. So now David has to act. He's heard that same testimony from two witnesses. And next time we're in 1 Kings, we will uh, see just how David does uh, act. But now I want us to think about Bathsheba. Having just thought uh, a little bit about Nathan, I want us to think a little bit about Bathsheba. And I want us to see that she loves the kingdom too. Bathsheba loves the kingdom. She listens to Nathan. She acts on his words. Verse 15, so Bathsheba went into the chamber to the king. Now the king was very old and Abishag the Shunammite was serving the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king. Then the king said, what is your wish? Her approach is humble. She bows to the king. She gives homage to David. He's her husband, but he's also God's chosen king. He is the ruler of God's people. And that's how she treats him. She treats him as God's chosen king. But at the same time, her approach is so direct. I'm going to paraphrase some of what she says. Uh, you told me Solomon would be the next king, verse 17. But Adonijah has crowned himself, verse 18. And Abiathar and Joab are with him, verse 19. Then in verse 20, And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. She's saying, David, everyone's looking at you. Everyone's waiting to see what you will do. You need to act. What are you going to do? She's so direct. And she continues, what's going to happen to Solomon and me if you die before all this is sorted out? Verse 21, otherwise it will happen when my Lord the King rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And that's the point where Nathan comes in to back up a story. And I've stopped there this evening because actually I think there's, there's enough in what we've looked at just here uh, to pull out a few very pertinent and what I hope are very helpful points by way of application for us as servants loving the kingdom. So thirdly and finally, loving the kingdom ourselves. Loving the kingdom ourselves. There are three lessons uh, I want to bring out briefly. The first lesson is honouring the king. Honouring the king. If we love the kingdom, we will honour the king. Both Nathan and Bathsheba honour King David. As weak and as frail and as ineffective as he seems to be, they honor him. And just think how challenging that must have been for Bathsheba. Just look at verse 15 for a moment. So Bathsheba went into the chamber to the king. And then look at what comes next. Now the king was very old and Abishag the Shunammite was serving the king. Why are we told that again? Why is that put in there again? Well, imagine the scene. She enters David's bedchamber where he sleeps. And she sees this beautiful young woman with David. I wonder how happy she actually was with the servant's arrangements. If anyone had an insight into the proclivities of David, it was surely Bathsheba. She knew what sort of man he was. The narrator has put this detail in here for a reason. It must have been so humiliating for her to come into her husband's bedchamber and see him with this beautiful young woman. Oh, we know that nothing happened between them, but put yourself in Bathsheba's place. How hard must that have been? 
But whatever she felt, she still recognizes David as God's chosen king. And she still honors him. Now, of course, our king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not David. He does not grow old or weak or frail. He will never need a nurse to look after him. And he is, of course, the most faithful and the most true of all husbands. But maybe, maybe uh, you tend to have a look around at the people around you. And maybe sometimes you think to yourself, well, the Lord Jesus Christ favors that person more than he favors me. He's blessing that person, whilst he's withholding blessings from me. And maybe that will lead us to not be honoring our king as we should. My friends, if we love the kingdom, we will honor our king. We won't be looking at how he's treating other people, what his relationships with them are like. We will be fixing our eyes on him. And our primary concern will be our relationship with him. We will be honoring the king if we love the kingdom. And the second lesson is if we love the kingdom, we will be acting for the kingdom. We will be acting for the kingdom. Some people actually like to bring uh, criticism here as we look at 1 Kings chapter 1. They will accuse Nathan of, of plotting. They'll say, it's all a little bit underhand. It's all a little bit Machiavellian. Nathan goes to Bathsheba and he recruits her. He tells her what to say. He gets his second witness by convincing her of the problem. And then they go together to convince, and this is often how the argument goes for the people that are saying this, to convince the senile King David to name Solomon as his heir when he had not actually thought to do so. David is old, but David isn't senile. When he is stirred, he can still act and act decisively. We will see that next time. Uh, and also, just to uh, correct this as well, in 1 Chronicles 22, verses 9 and 10, we read that God had specifically told David that Solomon was going to be the next king. So uh, Nathan and Bathsheba are acting for the kingdom. They know what God's will is. They are doing what they need to do to ensure that God's will is done. It is an act of faith. They step out in faith. They know that God has said Solomon will be king. They could, therefore, I suppose, just sit back and just wait to watch how, how God would resolve this situation. And sometimes perhaps how we think we kind of have that uh, almost fatalistic attitude, don't we? Well, God is going to do it, therefore I'm just going to sit back and let it happen. But that's not what we see here. No, what we see here is that they knew that Solomon should be king. They are in a place to do something about it to ensure that Solomon is king. Therefore, they act. They don't need any more special prompting. They don't need any more special guidance. They know what needs to be done, so they step up and they step out. And if we love the kingdom, we will be willing to do the same. When it is clear what needs to be done, we will be willing to step up and step out. But what I want you to notice is what their action actually is. What is it that they do? They don't order the army out to stop Adonijah. In fact, it seems that the army is almost on Adonijah's side, if not completely backing him. They don't hire assassins to, to take care of Adonijah. They don't do any of these things. No, they step out in faith by trusting the king to do what is right. They step out in faith by trusting the king to do what is right. Their action, the first thing they do is to take the situation to the king. Verse 15, so Bathsheba went into the chamber to the king. And verse 22, and just then, while she was still talking with the king, 
Nathan the prophet also came in. Their confidence is not in themselves. Their confidence is not in their own ability to do what needs to be done. Their confidence is in God's chosen king. They trust him to act. And yes, as we will see next time, David will call upon them uh, to do more in his service to resolve this situation and to ensure that Solomon is crowned. But for us this evening, this is the lesson I want us to, to close on. We may know that something needs to be done, that action needs to be taken uh, to preserve the church from a threat that is coming, either from without or from within. The temptation is also to think that, that actually we know just how the situation needs to be resolved. And we jump in feet first and get on with it. Nathan and Bathsheba bring the situation to God's chosen king. And they trust him to act, to do what is right. And then they are willingly used by him in his plan. Stepping up and stepping out. The first part of that is always prayer. It is always prayer. It is to always begin by bringing the situation to the Lord Jesus Christ, to our King, and telling him all about it. Because it's only when we have done that, it's only when we have spoken to the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, about the situation, that we are then ready to receive his leading and to act in a way which is pleasing in his service. And we need to trust him. We need to trust him like uh, Nathan and Bathsheba trusted David here. We need to trust that our king knows what to do in every single situation. And of course he does. This is King Jesus we're talking about. This is the king who knows the end from the beginning. This is the king who does all things well. So we can trust in him. So there's three lessons. If we love the kingdom, we will be honoring the king. And if we love the kingdom, we will be acting for the kingdom. And if we love the kingdom, we will be trusting the king to do what is right. And may God help us to be willing servants who love the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.